Welcome to module lecture section 1.2, where we're going to talk about the origins of astronomy. We're pulling a couple sections out of our textbook uh, for this video, um, one section from chapter 4 on the calendar, and then several sections from chapter 2, where we think about the start of astronomy. Now, our start in the slides is actually going to begin even further back in time than our textbook does. When we think about um, what the oldest science looks like, we have to recognize that for us to be able to define science as this method or frame of mind, um, we really have to be able to have the, the kind of safety and basic needs covered as human beings um, to be able to, to start to explore our world. And so we really need to understand that to have science, we need to have civilization. And to have civilization, we have to be able to go from hunter-gatherers to planting our own food and domesticating animals that we, that we know we can rely on. Now, the reason I bring this up is because predicting seasons is incredibly important for getting a high enough food yield. Knowing when to put plants in the ground and knowing when is the appropriate time to harvest them again um, is incredibly important for making sure that you have... Uh, that you have what you need to feed your people. Now on this slide, we have a couple of um, notes on really early ways of cataloging astronomy. So on the far left, um, we have an image of Stonehenge, uh, which we will talk about in its calendar context. Uh, we also have cuneiform tablets in the middle here. Um, these particular ones are observations of Halley's Comet. And on the far right, um, an Egyptian goddess, uh, Newt, uh, who is a description of the, the sun rising and setting. Now, astronomy is playing a role in all of these ancient civilizations, um, both in terms of being able to make sure that um, harvests are happening appropriately, but also to, to know when common... Um, common weather events like the flooding of the Nile are likely to occur. Now, I want us to recognize that in this discussion of the history of astronomy, astronomy has its roots in exactly the same people and the same circumstances that astrology has its roots. And neither of these are particularly um, good or bad in an objective sense. Um, but I do want us to understand that we are taking an astronomy class and we are not taking an astrology class. Uh, I, don't, I don't want us to be writing um, these two as interchangeable terms. I don't want us to get them mixed up, um, even though they sound similar. This is probably one of the most important distinctions that we need to make in these first couple of weeks of the class. So astronomy is a field of science, and we talked about the nature of science in our first video. And astrology is a belief system, and that doesn't mean that it is um, necessarily bad, although there are cultures um, around the world that use it in a very negative um, or controlling way. But it is a belief system, and we're taking a science class, and so it is not the focus of our course. But the reason that these came together is if we think, for example, about the Egyptians um, and their calendar, it was really important to know when the Nile was going to flood. And as the priest class was paying attention to the cycles of the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets in the sky, what was recognized was that a couple of weeks before flooding um, was common, a particularly bright star would be appearing at sunset. Um, and they called this star Sothos, we now call it Sirius. But by knowing, hey, I see that star in the nighttime sky, in a couple of weeks, the Nile is going to flood. That has a lot of predictive power that for the general population that did not know how that connection was being drawn, it seemed like a very mystical um, way of, of predicting the future. So astrology began um, right alongside astronomy um, and the Egyptians started to build um, up astrology and then ancient Babylon um, built its entire religion around astrology. So when we think about tracking time, um, I want to focus our attention on our calendar, something we might have taken for granted and never really thought that hard about. We know when our birthday is. Um, we know when we have to flip the page on a paper calendar we have in our, um, in our room. But I want us to think about um, any knowledge we have before this class on the astronomical origin of some of these lengths of time. 
So I've listed five here, um, and not all of them have a specific astronomical cycle in mind. So I want you to think about, um, and pause to think as long as you'd like to, about what it is that's occurring to define a day, a week, a month, a year, or a century. So pause the video and take your time. Okay. So the three correct um, cycles that we want to focus on are a year, a month, and a day. And I want to make sure that we understand um, what these three um, things are. Um, and you'll see this symbol um, show up, these kind of quarters, because as we talk about um, our calendar and as we talk about um, moon phases, we're going to be seeing these lengths of time and terms to describe these quarters um, of time as well. So a year is defined as how long it takes for the Earth to go around the sun. Um, and I actually want us to think about the day on the far right first. That's the Earth spinning on its own axis. We think of it as 24 hours um, from one clock time to the exact same clock time the next day, and that does define one exact day. Now when we think about the year then, Earth going all the way around the Sun, that takes 365.2422 days, um, so there's not an exact um, an exact number of days in a year. And it's why we have leap year, and it's why calendars, even going all the way back to Egypt, um, ancient Egypt, uh, had to account for that slight change. Otherwise, all of the um, alignment would be off um, from one year to the next. And then in the middle here, um, the month is defined as the moon's orbit all around the Earth. Um, and we will be talking in a later video about how that is also the moon orbiting uh, or spinning on its own axis. Also in upcoming videos, I want us to recognize that there's a lot of terms that we're going to learn. Um, I'm just having this up here briefly so that you can kind of get a preview of the fact that we are going to rely on a way of looking at um, a year, a month, and a day in terms that we can use to describe portions of it or specific um, moments in time for each of those. So these will all be terms that we talk about later on. Now let's talk about the day a little bit more detail. I mentioned that it was 24 hours exactly, and that is actually a specific definition of the solar day where we line up with the sun um, on one day, so like high noon, and we line up with it again on the next day. So high noon to high noon is a way to think about it. Although in a future video, we will talk about how the noon is not, uh, the sun at noon is not directly overhead like many of us might be thinking. There is a four minute difference between a different definition. We don't really need to write these down or worry too much about them, but I do want us to recognize because we're going to be talking about it um, in upcoming videos that when we're looking at the background stars, it actually only takes us 23 hours and 56 minutes to line back up with those um, background stars. And so that four minute difference is why our night sky changes over the course of the year. And what we see as constellations in October are not the same as the constellations we see in April. So there are lots of different ways to build a calendar. The ancient Mayan calendar was based specifically on counting days. Um, there were two different lengths of time, um, 260 days in one and 365 days in another, that each had their own name, and when they synced up with each other, um, that was one full calendar round. And the details, if you're interested, are in the lecture notes. Um, I'm not going to focus on them here. We can also focus specifically on counting moon cycles. So the Anishinaabe, um, the indigenous people, um, including Odawa, whose ancestral lands Grand Rapids Community College is built, um, they tended to focus their calendar on the moon phases. Um, and 13 moon phases fit in about the same time as a calendar year. Uh, so 13 times 28 um, gets us very close to our, our length of time that we call a year. Uh, and so that is something that is important to recognize too. That's a very valid way of tracking time and it's actually a lot easier to pay attention to the moon phase than it might be to um, what constellations are rising and setting with the sun. 
Tracking the sun's path is certainly what our current Gregorian calendar does. Our um, leap year is designed to put the sun right back in its place against the background stars so that every single time that you go out on, um, for example, April 2nd uh, and you look at the skies at night, you will see the same stars in the same place every April 2nd. That's what it means to um, track the sun um, with your calendar. Um, and otherwise you can track the stars at night to do that same thing, but typically we were building calendars around um, where the sun was so that we knew when our days got longer and when our days got shorter. And we're going to be talking about all of those seasonal changes in another video too. Now when we think about where the, um, the, te the textbook gets started, the textbook begins in um, ancient Greece, so really where the ideas of science were starting to percolate in the philosophers and scholars that were there. So over the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about three key facts that Greek scholars had figured out um, before even 100 uh, before Common Era. So they figured out that the earth is round and I want us to recognize that it is a common misconception that like even in the time of Columbus sailing the ocean um, that people thought he might fall off the edge. That is simply a, a myth. Um, humans have known for a very long time, not just scholars um, or priest class, that the earth is round and there are several different relatively straightforward ways of um, observing that and we'll talk about those. Greek scholars had also figured out ways to specifically measure the um, size of the earth, so figuring out the radius of the earth and therefore how big the globe had to be. To do that, they had to recognize and agree that the earth was a sphere. And then uh, even back in this ancient time, Greek scholars had figured out this very long-term motion that the Earth goes through called precession, um, which I do want to talk about. It's a key vocabulary term for us because it is in our course learning objectives, the kind of big full, um, full semester learning objectives. So I want to briefly mention that as well. So let's start by thinking about this idea of um, the Earth being round and how to determine that. So I want, to I want you to pause the video and look through all of these different options and decide um, what makes sense to you for evidence that the Earth is round. So go ahead and take your time on this one. Pause the video. All right, so the Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse is circular. That is, a, that is a fact, that is a statement um, that, is, that is true. And um, every single time uh, that there's a lunar eclipse, it's going into a circular shadow. And we're going to see that in our slides in module two. The only object that will always cast a circular shadow, no matter how the orientation is, would be a sphere. For the second one, if you travel north or south, which stars you see in the sky will change. And that is something that even in ancient Greece, they had enough travel routes um, that they could tell the difference um, in where the stars were, how they rose and set, what angle they were moving, how high certain stars were. Um, it will change if you're moving about on this curved surface. And then as a ship leaves port or any other distant object, um, as it goes further away from you, you will lose sight of the bottom of that object first, so the hull, um, before the mast, before the, the sails uh, leave your view. And all three of those were things that ancient Greek um, scholars could see and note. Um, and so the answer here would be number four, um, that all of the above are evidence. In modern times, we have a lot more different ways of gathering evidence, including taking pictures of the curved Earth um, from space. And then these two diagrams represent the other two bullet points I had on the previous um, slide, two slides back. So on the left, we have a diagram of what the experiment looked like um, that, that determined the size of the Earth. I don't want us to focus on the details, um, but there is a nice Cosmos video um, and uh, information in the textbook. If you're curious about more, we can always talk about it one-on-one um, -on -one as well. And then on the right um, is a diagram showing what it looks like um, to go through this large scale change um, called precession. So precession is the term used to describe the fact that the Earth's um, tilt, which is 23 and a half degrees, we'll talk about that more in another video, actually moves um, like a top would over a 26,000 year time scale. 
So we'll be talking about the North Star um, in the next video. Um, if you've heard that term, the North Star, we refer to Polaris in modern times. But Hipparchus figured out um, by looking at ancient ancient documents um, from other cultures that um, a different star, Thuban, was actually the one that was closest to where Earth's North Pole was pointing in the sky thousands of years ago. And if we wait 13,000 years in the future, we'll actually get to see Vega, um, which is a much brighter star, become our North Star. So stay tuned for that one. Now, both the science of astronomy and the belief system of astrology required very careful observation of the heavens, and often it was the same people um, that were doing both of these things. Uh, and that continues through some of the names that we will be talking about in the next um, couple of videos and um, the history that we will include in Module 3 as well. But it is important for us to recognize that if we hold on to a belief system, instead of having science as our frame of mind, it is hard to let go of um, beliefs differently than it is pretty straightforward for us to get rid of an um, incorrect hypothesis. So Ptolemy, back in ancient Greece, uh, created the first widely accepted model of the universe. And when we say universe here, we're really talking about um, the solar system, but also just what it means to have these stars in all, all different directions. But that model was based on two very incorrect beliefs. The first is that the Earth had to be at the center of everything, because we're the most important. That's called a geocentric model. We're going to talk about that um, as we continue. And the circle is a perfect shape, and if the heavens are a perfect place, then everything has to be moving in perfect circles. That one took a long time to fix, and we'll be talking about um, that one even off in Module 3 when we come back to this history idea um, when we talk about Kepler. Now, the simplest possible model that we might um, think of is the Earth at the very middle and everything being one circle around it. Uh, and even in ancient Greece, uh, it was known that observations did not fit that simple model. When um, planets farther away from the sun orbit, they orbit slower than the Earth does, so the Earth can catch up and pass them, creating this weird um, retrograde motion perspective uh, that even ancient Greek um, scholars could, could recognize and observe. I don't want to get too into the weeds about um, what these epicycles are, but what I do want us to recognize is that the model was not super simple. It required circles on circles on circles in order to fit the data. Because often it's represented more like this image here, where it's just a whole bunch of beautiful circles in a nice little diagram, and it is actually more complicated even in ancient Greece. Now, Talibi's model lasted over a thousand years. And this diagram um, or depiction is from the 1500s. And I want to note something important here. Um, first, the week, when we talked about our different um, time scales, we didn't mention the week as being a specific astronomical cycle, because it isn't. It is um, almost a perfect quarter of a moon phase cycle. So we'll talk about that in a later module. But it is also representing the seven objects in our night sky or daytime sky um, that weren't stars. So the sun, the moon, um, and the other planets that were known at that time. So going from the center out, we have Luna for the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun. So they knew, even back in ancient Greece, that Mercury and Venus act differently than the other planets. And we'll learn that that's because they are closer to the sun than we are. After the sun, we have Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then we have the sphere of fixed stars, because there wasn't a way to be able to... Um, Get the distances to stars way back when, and so we just kind of imagine that they were this big blanket around us, and we'll be talking about that model in the next video. Now, Nicholas Copernicus in 1543 published his heliocentric model. He was not the first person to come up with the idea that the sun might be at the center of the solar system, and um, the scientific community didn't automatically switch to his view uh, when he published, but he is the one who is most well credited for this idea. So in this new depiction um, from his work, we see that the Sun is put in the middle, then Mercury and Venus, and that is there where we find the Earth and the Moon um, orbiting the Earth. After that, we have Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and we still have this sphere of fixed stars because it's going to take a very long time for us to figure out how to get distances to stars. 
So the model was there in the 1500s, but um, no strong evidence to suggest that this was the only thing that worked. A lot of people still like the geocentric model because, as we've mentioned, it is hard to change a belief system. So in order to support Copernicus's model and to have us really make strides towards our current understanding of our solar system, we have to introduce Galileo Galilei. Um, he's often considered the father of modern science. Um, I think he's one of the most important figures in our history of science um, and certainly um, one of the most important figures in our history of astronomy. And we'll learn about Newton's law of gravity in a couple of weeks. You'll see that it's got Newton's name attached to it, but it's actually Galileo's um, experiments that were the foundation for that, um, for that law. So there's a couple of cool videos showing how um, things will fall at the same rate if they drop in a vacuum, whether that's on the moon or in a vacuum chamber. But for now, we're going to focus on um, the observations that he made um, that helped disprove the geocentric model. So Galileo did not invent the telescope. Um, a lot of people think he did. It had been invented um, in uh, Holland in the 1600s, early 1600s, basically this kind of pirate spyglass kind of thing for looking uh, long distances here on Earth, but he was the first one to use it for astronomical observations. So we're going to briefly go through a list of, of really interesting and informative things that Galileo looked at um, because this is really the start of this observation-based science rather than I believe what I'm told and we'll kind of go from there, authority-based science. So Galileo looked at the moon and realized from the shadows that the moon was not a perfect sphere like everybody thought, but it actually had craters and peaks and was a lot more interesting than that. He also looked at the sun, not directly, never looked directly at the sun. He didn't even use his telescope directly at the sun, but he projected it onto a piece of paper because it's so bright um, and realized that there were sunspots. So yet again, another object in our solar system um, that was not perfect, um, but had these interesting blemishes instead. When he looked at a dark patch of the night sky, expecting to see nothing, he actually saw a whole field of faint stars, stars that were too faint to see by eye, recognizing that the sky um, is really showing us that there is a lot more out there than what um, we can perceive just by eye. And when he looked at uh, Saturn, Another object that was not a perfect sphere. He noted that there were these strange bulges on other, either side. We eventually, um, modern science knows that those are the rings around Saturn. We'll see images of those later on. But Galileo recognized that there was something there um, on that planet and it was not a perfect sphere. And then another planet that he focused his attention on was Jupiter. So from one night to the next, he was looking at Jupiter and recognizing that there were these faint points of light that seemed to line up on either side of it, but they would change from one night to the next. He was seeing moons around a different planet, the first time anyone had discovered moons around a different planet, uh, which is why they are called the four Galilean moons. They are not the closest uh, moons to Jupiter, but they are the largest four. And so he recognized that um, a planet could have moons around it while also going around the sun, which is something that a lot of people said was a problem with the heliocentric model. Like, how would our moon be able to keep up around Earth if we were also going around the sun? So this didn't this didn't suggest that one model was correct and the other one wasn't, but it did throw out that that argument that how could the moon keep up if the sun is at the center of the solar system. The one observation that he did make that completely threw out the geocentric model was when he looked at Venus over the course of um, several months, he could see that Venus had a crescent phase, but also more lit up than a crescent. So he could see half of the um, the sphere lit up, he could see more than half. We're gonna learn that term is called a gibbous phase. Um, and that would not be possible in the geocentric model. And all of a sudden we have this key experimental test that completely throws out this incorrect hypothesis. That was the definitive proof that we needed. And within 40 years, only the heliocentric model was accepted. 
Um, this link here is an interactive um, for the phases of Venus, which is a really fun um, way to kind of see what this looks like and recognize that Venus also gets bigger when it's near the Earth in its crescent phases and smaller when it's on the other side of the Sun in its gibbous phases. Now, Galileo did not have an easy time of this groundbreaking um, belief-changing model. Um, he was put under house arrest uh, for publishing without going through the correct censorship process um, and was told that he could not um, publish anything about the solar system for the rest of his days. So he was um, under house arrest. He wrote up a lot of other physics experiments and we're very thankful to have those published um, findings. Uh, but it took until 1992 for the, the Vatican Church to acknowledge with a kind of formal statement um, that, they were, that they were wrong to punish him for, for publishing facts about the solar system. So thank you, Galileo. And um, this is where we will leave off for now, recognizing that astronomy has its roots um, way back. And uh, when we come back in our next video, we'll be talking about the seasonal changes that we started to hint at in today's video. Thanks for watching.